Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Hello, everyone. Uh, Chandra, we love you very much. Uh, thank you for getting involved in this podcast. As a suction medicine physician, we see lots of sort of associations between neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, provoked vestibulodynia, and endometriosis. And during this podcast, I said that endometriosis is endometriosal tissue, endometrial tissue outside the uterus, but it's endometrial-like tissue outside the uterus. I just wanted to cor- just wanted to correct that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Today, I'm speaking with two incredible physicians whose work and expertise has greatly improved the field of sexual medicine. Dr. Erwin Goldstein is a urologist here in San Diego who I've had the opportunity to work with for the past seven years or so. And Dr. Paul Young, who's a OBGYN and researcher in Vancouver, Canada. We're all a part of a society called ISWISH, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. ISWISH is a multidisciplinary international society that includes not only healthcare providers interested in this field, but also patient advocates. I'll be sharing the links to two events that are upcoming. The first is the fall course. It's in Arizona in October of this year, as well as their annual conference, which is in February 2024, located in Long Beach. This is a group of international healthcare providers who are interested in this field, both learning to be better providers as well as researchers that are looking to progress and learn more to advance the care for women's sexual health. We encourage everyone who's interested in checking out their website, getting involved. Like I mentioned, it's not only healthcare providers, but also there's a huge patient advocacy group within this organization. And we really encourage patients and providers to sign up become members, attend these events, because this is how we move forward in progressing women's sexual health. So today we're talking about a subject that is particularly interesting to me as a pelvic floor physical therapist. We're talking about two conditions, vestibulodynia and endometriosis, and how both are involved with painful intercourse or dyspronia. While this isn't purposeful, it is quite timely in that Dr. Yang and his team have recently published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine Reviews an article titled Neuroproliferative Dyspareunia in Vestibulodynia and Endometriosis. Many people with endometriosis also have vestibulodynia. There are a few different mechanisms which we will talk about in the show. As a pelvic floor PT, one of the most common reasons somebody goes to pelvic floor PT, either finds us or is referred, is because of painful intercourse. Many times they are diagnosed with interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome, vaginismus, vulvodynia, a long list of various conditions that aren't exactly right or maybe part of the picture, but not the whole piece. And they're really struggling to find the root cause of their issues. A lot of my patients are seeking help to solve their problems, but they also want to know why they're having problems. Unfortunately, because because of the limitations in research in women's healthcare in general, there are limitations in digging through the literature and, and better understanding why, which is why this research that Dr. Paul Young and his team are doing, as well as Dr. Goldstein, is so helpful because it's providing more insights as to why somebody may develop this, what are the underlying factors, and how we can eventually predict who may or may not experience this. So before we jump into the episode, I do want to give listeners some background as to what we're talking about and why. There are many terms that you'll hear, probably have never heard of them, and the conversation does get a bit medical heavy. So vestibulodynia is a subtype of vulvodynia, and many people have probably heard the term vulvodynia. You may even be diagnosed with it, or maybe you have a friend or a partner that suffers from this. Vestibulodynia is just a term to better define the region of pain. So the vestibule is the tissue that's located within the labia, and it's the tissue that surrounds both the urethra and the vagina. Typically, we don't even know this tissue exists. There's no problems. However, for some, there is a genetic predisposition, both in those that take oral contraceptive pills and those that also have a condition called neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. So these are two subtypes, and they both result in what's called provoked vestibulodynia. 
this means that whenever this tissue is touched, so think about penis and vagina sex, tampon insertion, that lovely speculum for pelvic exams, but even fingers and even pelvic floor PT because we use a finger to assess and palpate as well as treat the pelvic floor muscle. So when this tissue is touched or provoked and there is vestibulodynia, it's called provoked vestibulodynia. And this condition is probably one of the most common reasons those with painful intercourse seek help. They've often been to many doctors without any answers or things that have failed because they haven't really dived deep into the why. More commonly with endometriosis, I see the connection all the time between endo and vestibulodynia because first-line therapies for a treatment, in quotation marks for those people listening, is not a treatment for endo number one, but secondly, in many people can cause an additional issue, which is vestibulodynia or vulvodynia. So this tissue needs hormones. And so with provoked vestibulodynia that's caused by the use of oral contraceptive pills, there's a local estrogen or hormone deficit, not just estrogen, but testosterone as well. And this may even stick around long after you've come off of the birth control pill. And it's going to cause provoked vestibulodynia. So when you go to insert something, like I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of pain. And then this causes a reaction in the pelvic floor muscles to tighten up. And many people will oftentimes be diagnosed with vaginismus because they can't do a pelvic exam. Or they describe this to a physician that isn't fully aware of the sexual medicine diagnoses and get diagnosed with vaginismus, this sort of unknown reason your muscles are spasming. But similar to if you were to touch a hot stove, your muscles would pull you back reflexively around that. Now with neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, it's a little bit different. These people still have a genetic predisposition and some can be born with it, which is called congenital, and some may have had a reaction, maybe to a topical like monostat that created an allergic inflammatory reaction where increased nerve endings and even mast cells that now we're finding then cause further inflammation and pretty severe pain, but everything may look normal, which is really tricky for physicians to understand what is going on with you. So there's a few reasons why one may have insertional pain or superficial dyspronia when we talk about sex. With endo, we talk a lot about dyspareunia being one of the clinical manifestations, but we're referring more to this deep dyspareunia, meaning when the penis hits the cervix, technically it's really hitting probably innervated lesions that are creating pain, either in the uterosacral ligaments or the posterior cul-de-sac area, which we will talk a little bit more about in the episode today. So I'm really excited to talk with Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Yang today about this topic and share this information with you all and this community. I suspect there are many people out there who actually do have this condition, vestibulodynia, whether it's neuroproliferative or caused by birth control pills or hormone suppression, that probably are trying to find answers and are really having a hard time. We hope this information helps you. Dr. Yang and his team are currently doing some research studies. One is a survey about superficial versus deep dyspareunia. I will share the link in the show notes as well as I Care Better's Instagram page. But for those interested in participating, you must currently experience pain provoked by sexual activity involving insertion of an object, penis, finger, into the vagina, which has lasted for at least three months. You have engaged in sexual activity involving insertion of an object, penis, finger into the vagina in the last four weeks. You currently have a uterus and both ovaries present. Be willing to answer questions about sexual pain and how it affects your life. Be 19 years of age or older and be fluent in English. So if you meet that criteria and want to participate in his research, please look at the link in the show notes. Or check us out on I Care Better's social media page where this link will be posted as well. And with that, here's the conversation. Well, welcome. I'm super excited for both of you to come on the show and to share what you are doing. It's incredible for endometriosis. 
So I want to introduce the two of you, Dr. Erwin Goldstein and Dr. Paul Young. Dr. Paul Young is based in British Columbia, Canada, and is an OBGYN, does both research in endometriosis, and I believe also sur- surgery for endo. Is that correct, Dr. Young? Yep, yep, that's correct. Yeah. And Dr. Erwin Goldstein is here in San Diego, and I am lucky enough to work with him pretty closely. Not quite endometriosis specific, but has happened to be introduced to endometriosis in a lot of different ways, specifically some really amazing advances in the vestibulodynia population and better understanding of differentiation and new findings that have connected some of the basics of endo research unknowingly to this condition. And the two of them are part of ISWISH, which is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. I was first introduced to Dr. Yang uh, because of this amazing lecture he gave with neuroproliferative dyspareunia connecting some subtypes of those with endometriosis who also have this specific type of vestibulodynia. So can you both talk about a little bit about your practices, what you do, what your role has been in endometriosis? Well, why don't you start? Sure. Okay. It's, it's so, age, um, age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, OBGYN, and I, I did a, a fellowship in um, endometriosis, pelvic pain, and advanced laparoscopy. And I work at the Referral Center for Endometriosis in the province of British Columbia. Uh, most of my time is uh, is spent in research. And... Um, Early on in my career, I got, I got interested in why my patients with endometriosis, some were experiencing dyspareunia and some were not. And I was so glad to get in contact with an organization like ISHRIS that I was, actually was interested in that, that topic. And uh, we've continued that research over the last decade or so. So Paul was the scientific uh, program, either, I guess, chair and co-chair uh, initially. And he put together the amazing, amazing uh, discussions of these topics. At a Swiss, so we're very we're very happy to have him on board. <laughs> very much so. I think your lecture at the twenty twenty two conference was Friday at like five p.m. And I remember telling Stephanie and Josh and Lisa, I was like, "All of you better stay for this lecture." <laughs> and it was so great. They were all texting me like, "Jandra, this is what you've been talking about." I was like, "I know it's this is so incredible." So, Dr. Goldstein, how about you? What is your background? in treating patients with endometriosis? So I am a urologist, interestingly enough, but I've actually never practiced urology, so sad. Um, I got interested in sexual medicine, primarily for men at the beginning of my career. And then in 1998, when Viagra came out, we, uh, as lead author of the New England Journal paper, we were besieged by countless phone calls to our office, but they were all women. The vast majority of the phone calls were women, and it was very apparent to me that what we had in urology, which was a track studying the sexual dysfunction of men primarily, there was no parallel tract in, in the profession that Paul's in. There was no GYN sexual medicine track that, that was so popular in urology. So uh, it became evident that we would start ISWISH. (laughs) It wasn't ISWISH at the beginning, but it ended up being ISWISH. So in 1998, so it's 25 years, which is kind of cool, of this uh, group because we needed something to propel the the knowledge. So within the subgroup of the knowledge of women's sexual health is the condition of endometriosis. So we as sexual medicine doctors see women who have difficulty with... uh, having sexual activity because of severe pain. There's kind of an entrance version to the pain and a kind of a thrusting version to the pain. And uh, in general, the thrusting version is primarily an endometriosis one. The uterine tissue that's growing, the the endometrial tissue that's growing outside of the uterus, endometrial-like tissue, i.e. the definition of endometriosis, ends up being on a ligament that holds the vagina in place, called the uterosacral ligament. So as the, uh, during the thrusting of intercourse, the cervix is moved, the uterus is moved, the ligament is stretched, it's consisting of these nerves and mast cells that I didn't even know existed until Paul showed us the lecture. Um, and so ironic that we in the other side of dyspareunia, the entrance version, see countless women 
who have entrance pain due to nerves and mast cells. So here you go, the commonality of nerves and mast cells being at the in, within the tissue of the opening of the vagina called the vestibule, and the nerves and mast cells being within the sort of abnormal uterine lining tissue outside the uterus, the endometrial tissue, having the same condition. There's some, there's some research that has to link them. <laughs> Uh, by the way, um, while we're on this topic, and, and this is the free flow problem that I'm going to have today, we looked, okay. at, we looked at a group, 65 women who had uh, um, uh, um, special staining done on their excised vestibular tissue. So we know they have this condition where they have too many nerves and mast cells. And, and just keep it in, in, in check. That's what Paul found in the endometrial tissue. We also found they have higher prevalence of irritable bowel syndrome, of, uh, of asthma, of chronic sinusitis, of, uh, of uh, uh, other conditions for which mast cells are really critical in the pathophysiology of the disorder. So he's seeing endometriosis, I'm seeing vestibulodynia but they're broader in a larger mast cell disorder that, so, so I didn't tell you this and I haven't, Paul doesn't know this. We looked at the 65 patients and 63%, 63% have histories that have other mast cell disorder uh, issues. Mm. That's that. I was shocked when we got those data. Who knew? I thought we were just isolated vestibular uh, problems, but boy, oh boy, this is, we're in a larger dimension of a larger uh, problem. Mm, very interesting. If you look at the research side by side, there are a lot of similarities, and that's what I saw in your lecture was you broke it down so nicely and kind of side by side looked at I think some genetic predisposition, some of the inflammatory markers that are coming by. And what we do know is that not everybody that has endometriosis has the same symptoms. It's very heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where your work in phenotyping came in was we, we need to start looking at this kind of in different ways. And some lesions are not as innervated as others, but specifically in that posterior compartment of the pelvis, it, it tends to be correlated more to things like deep dyspronia, pain with deep thrusting, but that could be also, you know, speculum exams, fingers, tampon, well, maybe not tampons so much, things that are deeper inside versus entrance is fine. I think that is really crucial because there's a handful of papers on mast cells and endometriosis, but it's more research-based and nobody's really looking at that clinically. Is that correct? Dr. Young? Yeah, no, I, I, I think there still needs to be a few more steps before clinical application, but I, I think the um, there's kind of growing evidence. At, at that time of that lecture, I think I talked about this uh, genetic polymorphism in nerve growth factor, which induces nerve growth in, in uh, vestibulodynia. And actually, just recently, there was a, a huge meta-analysis for endometriosis genetics. And interestingly, nerve growth factor is also was one of the 42 loci in terms of inherited risk. And they, they hypothesize that it probably has to do with pain perception or, or maintenance. So it's just another example of the similarities between the between the two conditions. And I think one day in the future, we will have the situation where patients with endometriosis and maybe vestibulodynia will have kind of like a genetic risk profile. And we'll know if you have inherited this particular range of uh, uh, gene uh, changes and you're more you're increased risk for a painful type of, say, endometriosis. Mm hmm. Paul, Paul, I'm going to ask you a question. While this is Jandra's uh, deal, let me just ask you a question. I have a bunch of patients where I have their vestibular tissue stained with uh, 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 CD117 and PGP9.5 consistent with the, the, the mast cells and the nerves, respectively. And they have already had endometriosis excision surgery where I can get access to their tissue and then basically stain that tissue already obtained from the vestibule to the tissue that I'm going to get from their uh, excision through endoscopic surgery for endometriosis. Have you ever done that? Have, have you put side-by-side -side staining? Has anyone no, ever done that? I don't think so. That sounds like a 
I, that sounds like a great study uh, to have both. I, I know at, 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 in our area, vestibulectomy is not as common for a variety of reasons. So you have a unique opportunity there, I think, to, to compare the two tissue types. That would be a great study. Sue said you were interested in, in taking a whole bunch of our vestibular specimen. Is that, is that still true? Yeah, yeah, I think I like because uh, I think, you know, when it comes to looking at nerve growth, having um, the same standardized way of looking at the nerves, I think is important. So I was thinking you could take endometriosis samples and then vestibulectomy samples or biopsies and then use the same standardized antibodies and techniques and just make sure it's, it's everything is as st- standard as possible. And then I, it would be really interesting if you saw, you know, correlations between mast cells and, and uh, nerve growth. Uh, in, in both tissue types. So we've stained our vestibular specimen, not the endometriosis specimen, but the vestibular specimen for CD117 mast cells and PGP9.5 nerves, but also with calcitonin gene-related peptide and nerve growth factor. And we did it in a way where this, the sections are next to each other. Mm. So the nerve growth factor really correlates well with the mast cells and the calcitonin gene-related peptide correlates well with the nerves. You can actually, in co-localized staining. So we're seeing the same nerve growth factor. So, yeah. so I think, I think uh, yeah, there's uh, this amazing commonality. 20% of our population had both. And I think it's actually going to be way more than that as we get more and more. Can't diagnose endometriosis. Paul, you should comment on this for the listeners. There's no blood test, there's no x-ray, there's no ultrasound, there's no imaging. It's so frustrating. The only way to do this is through endoscopic examination. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultrasound and MRI are getting better, but a lot of groups are trying to get, you know, that blood test as that holy grail. But I think there's a, quite a few promising examples, but I think it's always the external validation. I think that always is difficult, but maybe one day there will be a blood test. Yeah, there's some people doing some various testing currently. Uh, there's like a tampon study where they're looking at different blood markers and menstrual fluid and menstrual blood. But I think it's a we have to start somewhere, right? So we might pick out one factor and build on that for research to build a, a bigger picture of what that looks like and what everything is looking at because they may have these biomarkers, but it's the epigenetics of things and the inflammatory markers that can trigger these inflammatory cascades and gene expression. So, so yeah. I want to I want to bring up uh, a very important point with, that uh, non-surgical management of endometriosis with agents that deprive people of critical hormones. I just want to come against it in a very public way. It's awful. It's just awful therapy. What, what you do is you, you generate a new problem by treating the endometriosis, maybe not even successfully, but by depriving people of essential hormones, which is the strategy. You get bone disease, muscle disease, you get uh, fatigue, symptomatic things. But oh my gosh, you introduce yet a new uh, dyspareunia problem. There's a condition called hormonally mediated vestibulodynia. It's extremely prevalent in those patients who choose medical management. I, I beg those in the audience listening to this, consider the diagnostic endoscopic examination. This is a surgical disease. You know, the irony of, that we're talking about is neuroproliferative vestibulodynia having similar findings in endometriosis. They're both surgical diseases. And, and why are they both surgical diseases? Because they have too many blessed nerves in there. How do you get rid of the nerves? You can't magically... Yeah. Go away, go away, nerve. You know, you can't do that. So I don't know. I was going to say, I wish we had better medications for endometriosis for sure. And then you add the other uh, layer, which is that these medications also, you can't conceive while on them. And many patients with endometriosis and infertility are trying to conceive. So you add that complexity on top of it. It's really, it's heartbreaking that uh, there are not better medical options. But yeah, sur- surgery though is, is available. I'll give yeah. you uh, an example of a cool future therapy. Uh, there, there are at least seven or eight, at least in Canada, at least in the U.S., probably also in Canada, uh, government-approved treatments that are calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor blockers. And it's probable that a lot of the pain in endometriosis is in part due to the, neuro, the, the neurotransmitter uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide. So 
Um, have you done or have you heard of prospective studies in women with painful endometriosis taking these uh, migraine medicines, these calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor blockers? You have not heard of that? I, I haven't, not, at least the last time I looked at it, but it's, it would seem to be a prime candidate because they're already approved for migraine. So, um, yeah. I, and they're, they're approved in Canada, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Someone has to do this research. I think yes. we'll do this together with Chandra. <laughs> yes, yes, please. I think one of the problems, too, is that the the research has not been very focused on endometriosis in the past. And I think in the last five years or so, it's really ramped up and people are looking at different factors. It's such a minuscule thing that they can measure because you have to do it one step at a time. You have to isolate different factors. And it's probably similar to different mast cell conditions where there's probably several triggers that can turn these gene expressions on and create the inflammatory cascade. I've seen recently with some of these articles being published, it's they get kind of bashed on a little bit, um, saying it's not good research because it's not necessarily promoting excision surgery. And that's not really the full picture because we have to start somewhere to isolate, to better understand what these triggers are, which can then direct future treatments that are not just surgical. And surgery is probably never going away, just like with neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. They, you know, there are different topicals that have been tried and different treatments conservatively, but in the end, they haven't really shown promise, whereas the vestibulectomy has shown a huge improvement and long-term, right, Erwin? Yeah, uh, long-term. Why don't, why don't you take advantage of you being the moderator here and tell us about the role of PT in endometriosis, the, the, the role not only of helping people, but of encouraging them to get appropriate management. Yes, thank you for saying that. Because it's not, PTs are in a prime position to help patients, not just with the musculoskeletal presentation, which can be present, you know, from the start, but it also is a secondary factor. If you start having painful periods and primarily it starts with painful periods, I would say, or constipation, GI dysfunction, as the estrogen starts to perk up even a few years before they start their period, it's not an estrogen disease, which is why these like first line therapies aren't really treatment. It's mediated by estrogen, but it really is this inflammatory disease. And so if you're in pain every month, you know, for seven to 10 years, which is the current delay of diagnosis, of course, your muscles, your not just in your pelvic floor, but in and around are going to be tight because it's like, if you touch a hot stove, you're going to pull back automatically. So you have just tension building month after month after having so much pain. And then many, it's not for lack of trying, but they're you go to the doctor. I know for, for me in particular, end up in the ER shortly after starting a period. And they're like, yeah, she ruptured a cyst, take her to the gynecologist. And what did they do? Put me on birth control, was on birth control. My, you know, until I was 20, some form of pill ring, whatever. And then you end up with, sexual dysfunction to some degree. I had no reference point as to what that was. Like, I don't think I had sex till I was 19 or 20. So I'd already been six years on some sort of hormone suppression. So when I first learned about Iswish and I was first introduced to Josh Gonzalez, I stopped that pill that, that same day that he talked to us and got my labs done. And so many things made sense as far as what I had experienced. That was my only reference point to then what was life after getting off, doing some of the treatments. And luckily it wasn't more neuroproliferative. It was more hormonal. It made so much sense. So as PTs, we can help, of course, with our manual therapies, our education in treating musculoskeletal dysfunction. But I think we're in a prime place to start screening for these other things that aren't going to be treated with PT and aren't going to be treated with excision surgery alone and identify, screen, and refer out because we have the resources to do so. Yeah. We have a PT in, at our clinic that does a lot of pain neuroscience education, like you said, and it's core to, to everything. I think it's even if the patients have a better understanding of that before surgery, I imagine it actually, it actually helps long-term uh, as well after surgery. Paul, let me ask you a question. Um, in terms of uh, neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, when we do a complete vestibulectomy, you know, the entire 1 to 11 o'clock and even including the 12 o'clock if it's 
consistent with pain. Uh, our long-term data are excellent. There, there, there's no regrowth of these nerves and mast cells that uh, reside within the vestibule. What are the data with endometriosis? Do, do you have... Is it common to go back a few years later because of recurrence, or what is the what is the long term role of uh, the management? Well, I think the data is kind of, a little bit kind of everywhere for a variety of reasons. So, I think um, one of the so there's some data suggested after things like excision of endometriosis, half of patients will have a reoperation by five years. But I think part of the problem with that is that. Uh, Patients need to be well phenotyped to know why is there a pain recurrence uh, before deciding whether, you know, it could be due, related to something else before deciding to reoperate. So at our clinic, we, um, we really try to phenotype people when people come back with pain after surgery. And uh, with that uh, strategy, our reoperation rate, like five to 10 years follow-up is about 15% because we try to reserve surgery really to the true lesion recurrence and not where it's it's related to you know something else uh, like like the pelvic floor or another cause of pain so you mean by phenotype to rule out other reasons for pelvic pain That's yeah. what Sim similar to what you do with the the regions uh same idea it's just trying to find wh where exactly is the pain coming from patients, what percentage of phenotyping will then turn to say vestibular pathology is, is, that that happens right Vestib vestibular pain yeah yeah, we published as forty percent of our patients meet the criteria for for provoked vestibulodynia. Really, the, where the main issue is actually like endo and pelvic pain. So uh, we screen all patients for it. So like like you said, there seems to be this co coexistence. Let me introduce a, a new test <laughs> on this topic. So this has never been done before. So Jandra, this is the first on your program. Okay. Bye. Um, here, I have a pen in front of me, pen, and I have the back of my hand, okay, and I take the pen and I just lightly brush it on my, my hand. I call this the allodynia test. I don't know. We, we needed a name for it, so we made it, we made it up. If you stroke, lightly brush the back of your hand, ostensibly the back of my hand has, you know, five or six nerves in the area, then you'll get a, a, a brush, a, a tickle sort of outcome. If you brush a woman with hormonally mediated vestibulodynia, you get a tickle. You brush a person with uh, lichen planus, lichen sclerosis, you get a tickle. You brush a person with pelvic floor dysfunction, you get a tickle. If you brush somebody who has neuroproliferative disease, just doing this causes them to scream in pain. Raw, burning, broken glass, tearing, ripping sensations just by lightly brush. It's the craziest, simplest test on earth. And it reveals, I mean, what, how else could you get that type of a clinical response by lightly brushing something against the tissue other than it has too many nerves in it? I would love for you to figure out how to brush an endometriosis lesion in the pelvis. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to think about that. But uh, we, we sort of do, like on our exam, we try to do a very careful exam of like our pelvic exams in terms of pressing at, at around the uterosacral ligaments, like a very light touch. So it's sort of like allodynia, but it's not quite the same as with, um, you know, with the, uh, the brush, but similar. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And another similarity too, as far as, because you were asking about the role of PT in this population, this kind of relates, but similar to somebody undergoing surgery for endometriosis, depending on many factors, but healthcare, 
you know, like Canada's healthcare is different than the U.S. healthcare, but also if you land in the right surgeon at the right time, and that surgeon is very much like, yes, you probably have endometriosis, excision is the the way to go. They may do surgery right away where other doctors may spend a year doing management of all these other pain generators so that they have a better outcome. So similar to those undergoing neuroproliferative, uh, under, undergoing surgery for neuroproliferative vestibulinogenia, when they come out of surgery, how amazed are they when they do that? And they're like, I don't believe that there's no pain. Next but, day. But <laughs> yeah, One they day. don't believe it. <laughs> but then they get into PT and some of them still have a lot of pain and have, you know, it's a, it depends really. Like some do really well and I see them one or two times just to like make sure that they're good. But some patients still have a lot of pain because it's a muscular response of how many years have they been trying to insert tampons. I have one woman right now, she was a swimmer and with neuroproliferative and, you know, she just forced herself to insert that tampon every time because how are you going to wear a pad when you're having a period and you're a very heavy bleeder? You can't. So they kind of have these years of painful pelvic exams, dismissal, medical gaslighting, whether that's probably more so unintentional. But of course, they're still going to have more pain after, but it's not the vestibule anymore. It's pelvic floor. Similar to endometriosis, there's so many different generators of pain that if you help to identify as best you can and work on those beforehand. When they come out of surgery, they know what's what. Oh, I feel better on this end, this end, but I still have this. And you're like, yeah, well, now that a huge root of your pain got taken away, now these things and these therapies that maybe made only so much of a difference beforehand actually work much better now and they have a better understanding. Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead. No, no, no. You, I, I spoke way too much today. <laughs> so, so just briefly, we just published a paper on endometriosis surgery outcomes. And, you know, people did, uh, on average, very well afterwards. But people who had pre-existing musculoskeletal pain, you know, whether the abdominal muscle muscles or the pelvic floor muscles, they had less improvement at one to two years of follow-up. Because, and those are the patients that needed care of those other conditions as well. So exactly what you were saying, we, we found in our data. I'll bet you this is a similar conversation, but we have as part of our facility a an amazing uh, therapist. Uh, her name is Dr. Hartzell, and she sees every one of our patients all the time uh, as part of our multidisciplinary thing. And if we call out those women with neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, and I, I don't have a large enough endometriosis population, but I'll bet you it's the same. There's unbelievable mental health challenges in this population from from uh, um, uh, trauma and abuse to uh, to uh, PTSD from from painful penetrations to relationship stresses to family stresses, um, and there's no way you can you can manage patients without concomitant physical therapy and sex therapy following surgical excision. That that's a mandatory thing in our place. PT. Mm. The EMDR is is one of the more cool things. Eye movement, uh, um, EMDR, desensitization. desensitization and reprocessing. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you do that with your patients, but Rose does that a lot with our patients. And hmm. uh, it's a PTSD successful strategy that is non-pharmacologic. And yeah, I've seen it work very well, actually, as w especially with the trauma piece of it, um, just working. It's almost like an exposure, but also there is more of a physiologic process of that reprocessing, which should bring Rose on here and have that conversation with her. Percent, She's brilliant. You'd love yeah. her. Well, and this kind of ties in. Last year at IPPS, you spoke a lot about the, the use of the CSI, the Central Sensitization Inventory. And helping, I think your findings were in endometriosis that you could almost predict based on certain things who was going to be more centrally upregulated. Is that kind? Of, was that kind of the gist, if I remember correctly? Yeah, it's like it's one of several questionnaires I could assess for a lot of yeah central nervous system. Uh, uh, I guess increased activity for nociception, and uh, we found that um, it correlates like with levels of pain at baseline, and similarly with surgery. The higher the score on this questionnaire, there's relatively less improvement. There's still improvement, but relatively less improvement. And 
the questionnaire has a lot of items on um, systemic whole body symptoms. So things like effect on sleep and, and pain elsewhere. Let me ask you a question. If you have a person with high central sensitization of pain, would you have a high association to a history of mast cell disorders? And I, these are the ones we looked at, endometriosis, irritable bowel, interstitial cystitis, migraines, fibromyalgia, food allergies, asthma, and chronic sinusitis were the ones we looked at. Do you think those people with a high central sensitization would have more history of exposure to, to like mast cell disorders? Yeah, for like amongst those conditions, we definitely found uh, um, irritable bowels more common, um, painful bladder slash IC, and migraines. We didn't look at those other ones, but those definitely correlated with a higher higher CSI score. There's something about all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something to it. And there's a large part in the brain, and that's Jason Kutch's research that we'll be talking about at ISWISH next year. Independently, they have many factors. In the region areas of the, the algorithm, it's the brain piece of it. Do you think there are so. mast cells in the brain <laughs> that, that release factors that activate the central sensitization? Because that would make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I don't know. To, I don't know. But that's a good do, question for Tanya. Yeah. With the patients who have CSI, high CSI scores, what do you do with them before or after surgery? Is it a lot of pain re-education? Is it use of neuromodulators? Yeah, we offer all of those things. And before surgery, but it depends on the situation. Some people want to do it before surgery. Some people want to do it after. I mean, for some people who, you know, been in pain for years and you know haven't had a diagnosis, for some people they really want surgery to get an answer. So I tell them, okay, you know, your recovery might be a bit difficult, more difficult because of these other factors. But you know, we allow them to make that that choice, and then after surgery, then we just focus on those other factors. So depends on the situation. We'd be one day would love to do a trial in terms of randomizing people to do that pain neuroscience education before or after surgery and see whether we notice any differences, but maybe one day. What about age as a variable here? Do, do, do we see, I mean, very commonly our patients are uh, late teens, early 20s, uh, but there are people who kind of miss the boat and they're in their 40s. And our experience is they don't do as well. But I'd love to hear what you think of age as a sort of a factor. Yeah, I, for endometriosis, we actually found that younger patients, they still improve, but they don't seem to improve as much. I mean, I think that's really like a very, it's like an on average is a very rough kind of, like, I don't know what the story is behind there. If there's like a, it has to do with the referral patterns. I, I'm not sure. Like we also have some differences based on ethnicity. And again, I don't know whether it's a referral issue rather than real biological difference or not. So, but yeah, I just very just empirically we we actually noticed the other we all notice the younger patients do a little not don't improve well, they improve but not to the same degree on average as the well i don't know are why you talking in the 40s like 40 year old women or what are we talking about 30 like year old 20s uh versus 20s does less well yeah rel relatively speaking yeah, huh, they still that's improve the but... that's interesting okay yeah i wonder if there's more like environmental factors you know patients in their 40s and 50s weren't as exposed to more highly processed foods or environmental, you know, that, that we have so commonly. And uh, Dr. Orbach talked a little bit about this too. And uh, there's obviously a genetic component to this. So when the when a daughter has signs and symptoms of endometriosis and you start to dig into their family history, they get it. And she mentioned something about that. We know that there is a role like of certain things like dioxins in pregnancy and exposures. Just in the world we live in now, we ha we are exposed to so much more that they didn't have. So I do think or suspect that that could be something that might be relevant to sure. those undergoing surgery at, you know, maybe later 30s or 40s compared to, you know, teens or in 20s. Hmm. More stress, maybe. <laughs> Social media, all, yeah. all of those factors, too. So, yeah, Paul, yeah. we've seen daughter, our sister, sister. We've seen mother, daughter. We've seen cousin, cousin uh, with uh, in the same families have the need for neuroproliferative vestibulodynia oh. uh, surgery. What about your experience with endometriosis? Same kind of thing? I think anecdotally I've seen it, but I, we haven't looked at it systematically. But I, yeah, I, I imagine there would be a similar, a similar thing. 
Like, here's a good example. I had a diagnostic lap. I knew what I was getting into. It wasn't with a specialist. I wasn't convinced that it was endo. So then after, I was like, you know, excise anything you see, but just take a lot of pictures knowing, like, I can take this to a specialist, but I just want to see what's going on. And that's what happened. You don't, you know, we didn't see anything. Left uterosacral was kind of interesting. We took a biopsy. They took some fluid that had been remained in my pelvis. I did a month of transvaginal ultrasounds to look at this fluid that I was like, hey, could this be it? And sure enough, actually, that's where the endometriosis cells were found. My first excision surgery, my mom was there and she's like, oh, did I ever tell you why I had a hysterectomy at 31? No. (laughs) That would be helpful information. She's like, after your sister, I just was bleeding a ton and like big clots and there was a lot of pain. And So they just removed my uterus and I was fine after. Did they say anything about that? She's like, well, they said it was probably double the size of a normal one. I'm like, that's probably adenomyosis. Mm. I was 31 when that happened. Mm. Great information to know at 13 when I'm going to the ER. Yeah, I've definitely heard a similar thing. Yeah, when people dig into their history and there's something, there wasn't like a, don't have the formal name, but it sounds very suspicious. Yeah. We see that with tampon use. So, you know, you're 11, 12, 13, you're at your menarch and you try to control the bleeding with the tampon and you can't. And the mother would say, well, I couldn't do it either. (laughs) Yes. Is that a, you know, you didn't teach it well or was there actually pain? They just didn't know the information we have now. Mm. I want to break down a little bit and connect this for people that don't know what vestibular adenia is because I think that there's still a lot of people that don't know. So we have a few different types of vestibular adenia. We have hormonally mediated vestibular adenia that happens often after medications to suppress hormones like birth control pills or aromatase inhibitors or things like Lupron and Orlissa. We've seen this. So that's one type. And of course, first line therapies for endometriosis are these drugs, though they don't really treat it, they can manage symptoms for some. But then there's another concept of neuroproliferative. Can you explain that a little bit better so people understand what the heck we're talking about with all these big words. So the vestibular dynia is just a a classic crazy medical term. The word dynia just means pain. So, you know, if if my chin hurts, that's chinodynia. So vestibule is just a a locate anatomic location. So it's pain in the vestibule. So there's an algorithm that sort of uh, helps us understand so there's inflammatory reasons, so vaginitis, disquamative inflammatory uh, vaginitis, there's candidiasis. So there's an inflammatory construct. There's a dermatologic construct with the lichen sclerosis, lichen planus. There's neurologic ones, pudendal neuropathy, and even going higher up the chain to the cauda equina, sacral radiculopathy. Then there's, of course, what you do for a living, the pelvic floor physical therapy area. Um, and then there's the, uh, the provoked versions where you have it throughout the entire vestibule uh, and it happens when you press on it. And then we've added a, a new layer with this sort of tickle thing. In the provoked vestibular DNA, we can now separate A from B, which, which really hasn't been done clinically before. So uh, th- that's kind of a cool thing. So vestibular DNA uh, affects relationships, affects self-esteem, ego. Uh, it's, it's a big thing. There's a lot of people in the U.S. who, well, excuse me, around the world who have this. Another form of vestibular dynia, um, well, of dyspareunia or painful intercourse would be, of course, the endometriosis, where it's not just the entrance. It's more the, as you're in, it's fine to go in. It's just really difficult to move uh, and thrust well uh, during sexual activity. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a specialty of medicine, and uh, I think some of the problems are when patients go to providers who aren't sort of focused in on this, they often get a thing, well, I don't see anything, must be in your head, have a glass of wine. This medical gaslighting that you brought up, it's really genuine, it's really real. I, I just wish that if doctors just don't know something to say, hey, you know, I'm good at this, but I'm not really good at what you have. Let me find you a specialist or let's look together to find somebody rather than giving you wrong advice. It's just so sad that people aren't ready. Providers aren't ready to say, I just don't know. (laughs) Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And if you don't understand something, you can only make conclusions with the information that you have. Right. 
Excellent. Yeah, and dyspareunia is one of the main clinical manifestations of endo, but I rarely see it broken down into deep versus superficial. And so I think it it does a disservice to those saying, yes, I have that and I have endo. Why isn't my dyspareunia better now? Well, that's because it could be superficial or it could be deep. And pelvic floor muscles can also contribute to deep dyspareunia as well. And so the, the exam that Dr. Young mentioned, where you kind of can get up and feel, you might see also other changes like the cervix being pulled one way versus the other. And, you know, it's relatively easy to press on a muscle, ask them, one, is it painful? And two, does it reproduce those symptoms? And then go to a different structure that's non-muscular. And then they jump off the table and they're like, uh, that was terrible. And now you have more information and it takes about two minutes. I think one of, one of the things I really appreciated from my mentors who got me interested in this field is a very careful examination. I think exactly like you said, like not rushing it or just pressing here, here quickly, but, you know, really trying to figure out where the pain's coming from. So that's something I really value. How did you end up in the field of endometriosis and OB in general? And did your practice look like it did back when you first started to now, or was there kind of an aha moment? I know you mentioned about being interested in dyspareunia, but is that how you got into the endo as you noticed a lot of dyspareunia and then endometriosis? Or can you share a little bit about that? Sure, just quickly in residency, I was interested in maternal fetal medicine, but then I did a the great thing about a residency program is they had a rotation that was focused on endometriosis and urogyne. And so I just was inspired by my mentors and I had good evaluations. Like most of my other evaluations were Paul is too quiet, but this one was uh, <laughs> we really liked this guy, he's really interested in all this stuff. So they really inspired me and then that's got me into it. And in terms of how the the field has changed. I think I think patients like more awareness and patients being more empowered. I think that's that's uh, increased over the last decade or so, as far as I can tell. Let me ask you a question: the, These drugs that industry promote to to deprive people of hormones are also, in a way, promoting the condition of endometriosis. So it's there's more, even though I wish people never used these things. The fact is, they're at least discussing the condition. Do, do you see any benefit to that at all? Or or the misinformation overrides the benefit? Well, I can only report on the findings in our clinic where 40% of patients or so say they their pain was not better with the traditional hormonal suppressive therapies or another 30, 40% or so, and there's some overlap there, said they couldn't tolerate the side effects of it. So we published that a few years ago, so I can only report what people are are saying, and that that's that was our experience. Now, there, you know, it's it's a referral center, so you know, it's not a, a population sample. Um, there was a, a study a few years ago where they looked at risk factors for invasive endometriosis, and then one of them was a previous oral contraceptive use. But um, so people, there was kind of some controversy after that. But uh, I, it's hard because it's not, you know, it's like an observational study, so there's multiple confounders, but. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's a need for better medical therapies that are using, uh, looking at the disease in a different way rather than just the same thing, which is different ways of suppressing the HPO axis. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that could be the calcitonin gene-related peptide yeah. receptor blocker. Part of the issue is that for so long, we've thought of this as a, you know, a gynecological disease, although we know estrogen is very important in mediating it as far as like turning certain things on, which is why a lot of the symptoms come about as estrogen starts to increase. And so, you know, the thought was, oh, it's just retrograde menstruation, it's endometrial tissue coming out and then implanting. But what we now know more of, like this tissue is different than the endometrium. There's a lot of similarities. So the definition has sort of changed and shifted to endometrial-like tissue. It's not quite the same as endometrial tissue. And there's been, you know, factors that th there's certain gene factors or certain factors they've seen and researchers have noted on, like, there's cellular adhesion molecules that are more present in those with endometriosis that allow, like, this invasion into the tissue um, among a number of different cytokines that are released, interleukins and TNF-alpha and I'm very interested in what you were talking about with the calcitonin re gene related peptide. PGRP. Yes. And so when you have researchers, I think, looking at this from a menstrual disease and refluxed 
endometrial tissue, you're going to treat like, well, how do we suppress the estrogen? How, we, how do we do that? And so for so long, our basis of the understanding of the disease was missing some crucial factors. So a lot of this, these treatments have been aimed at just kind of identifying sort of the wrong thing or without all the information. But now we're starting to know that there's more to it. We have to understand more about it before we can generate more treatments for it, right? Paul, Paul, have there been studies of people getting uterine biopsies, so endometrial tissue that resides in the uterus, and the endometrioma, endometriomas that you remove, and looking at differences? Have, has that ever happened? Yeah, yeah, that's been... So that's what, like, what are the differences? Well, well, everything that Chandra said? The problem is that there's... Well, I think that I think it's... Most people would agree that uh, endometriosis cells are different, but I think that the degree of difference, I think there's a lot of debate and there's, sometimes the studies are, are contradicting each other. Um, but I, I, think, I think most would agree that there's, it's not just simply endometrium, that there are some gene expression differences, like, you know, exactly, you know, exactly what they are. And, and you know, I think it depends. A problem with a lot of this research is that if you get a group of endometriosis with a um, certain symptom profile or recruited in a certain way, you might see slightly different things if it's a, recruited in a different way, which points to the need for, I think, for, for big popul bigger studies where you, you don't have those kind of sampling differences, I think. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Wow. So here's, here's yeah. a great study. If you biopsied the uterus and looked for nerves and mast cells versus the endometrial tissue outside the uterus and looked for nerves and mast cells, I'll bet you a million bucks you wouldn't see the nerves and mast cells in the uterus, but you'll clearly see it in the in the retroperitoneum. What do you think of that? Well, some there have been a few studies, and we're actually interested in doing the same thing. The problem, like, you know, with research is that there's there's uh, like always all things. There's like sometimes the, the studies don't correlate. For example, some people say it's how you do the endometrial biopsy. So one group did it in a very specific way with a specific instrument, angled a certain way, and then they were able to find more nerves. And another group did it a different way. So it's was, it was all contradicting. But uh. Yeah, I don't think it's completely settled, but yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, apparently, yeah. The group that really has, has found them said you have to do it like a certain time of the cycle and then it has to be done in a very specific way. And they, they, did, they showed hysteroscopy photos of what it looks like if you actually do it the way they do it in their paper. But anyway, yeah, We're, we... we, we put it in one of our grants that we were going to do the same thing. So I guess we'll see what we, what we find. Interesting. Well, let me share, I'm going to share a slide. Um, I may or may not keep it in, or I can share it elsewhere, but this is sort of looking at a lot of the different research that's looking at these factors. And so I kind of broke it down this way, looking at the presence of the lesion. So we have these different theories, endometrial derived theories versus non endometrial derived. Then there's this whole, you know, aspect almost cancer like where maybe the immune system suppresses and doesn't clean up, then there's sort of this ramping up of the immune system. And these are the factors that I generated from a few studies and kind of put in this way. So to kind of explain, like, how does it get from whatever cell it starts as to this manifestation of pain and symptoms, if you look at different research, probably even the research you're doing, Erwin, but also mast cell research that has nothing to do with endometriosis, you see a lot of these same things come up time and time again, but you have an allergist or an immunologist or a mast cell specialist looking at it at one lens. You have an OB looking at it at a different lens. You have a pain management looking. A lot of it is actually overlapping. I think you should publish this in, in journal, the uh, Sexual Medicine Reviews as a yeah. review of all the papers that allow you to get from A to B here. That's very cool. So that was the starting point of why I became more interested in looking at that, because I do think it's fascinating to look at it in this kind of lens, because then you start to make sense of this multifactorial process. This is just what we know. And this was done in, I think I did this in like 2020. I think we even know more now. Good job. Yes, I like it. For those having painful intercourse, can you both share from your kind of your lens, what can you do about it? What are some symptoms to hone in on and who you can go and see or how you can find providers like you if they're not local to get help with this? Paul, you first. 
Oh, Erwin, that's an important question. Erwin, you go first. <laughs> well, so we have this biopsychosocial uh, model. So all patients are first seen by the, the psychologist. So that's a very important issue to discuss the mental challenges that are associated with the pain. We then spend an hour with them uh, reviewing some of the, uh, at least based on their history, some of the at least expected diagnoses that we're likely going to find on examination. And then our claim to fame is to have patients see their entire anatomy on a, vo on a vulvoscope in a big, huge plasma TV in front of them. So they and their partner can actually see. It, go it stems from the complete 180 degree opposite of when women lie in, in a room, uh, there's a sheet in, above them. They don't get to see the examiner. The examiner leaves. It's just the most bizarre, antiquated system. When I grew up, when I did my, my rotation in GYN, you couldn't get in the room until the nurse allowed you. The patient was completely undressed with a gown on and a big sheet above them. If they were in, in the stirrups, we would come in through a separate door. They didn't see us. We didn't see them. We did our exam and left. And then the patient was allowed to leave. No, no discussion. It was awful. And now we're having patients see what the hell we're doing. We're pressing and poking and doing tickle tests and all that. But they're actually seeing what we're doing. We're reviewing heart's line. We're reviewing the anatomy. And when we do the internal exam, put our fingers on the cervix and move it, and we're seeing them writhe in pain, we're saying, oh, that is highly consistent with uterosacral involvement. You should really go to see a Paul Young person and get your endometriosis. In San Diego, Spring Robinson is the Paul Young person. And yes. she's awesome. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a team effort to find. But I think the most contemporary way to do this to allow patients to participate and see. I don't know if you do valvoscopy where patients see it in, in British Columbia. Do you do that or not really? No, I, I'm all... Yeah, I, I'm only at the endometriosis clinic now, so we don't we don't okay. do we don't have the equipment. I would just say exactly the same as Irwin said. So biopsychosocial approach, very careful examination, patients as partners in the decision making. I think that's really important. And the only thing I'll add is that we know we've looked at the demographics of our clinic. We know it's not the same as the demographics in our province. So I know there's populations of people, there's communities out there that are probably experiencing these symptoms that are not accessing care. So I guess if people are, are experiencing dyspareunia, just to advocate as much as they can and do as much research and reach out because the symptom is important and uh, you know deserves appropriate care. Yeah. That was beautiful. <laughs> yes, well said. I will share you know information regarding ISWISH on the show notes because that's a great place to start for resources. And you may not know that there's a provider kind of right in your backyard that you can go and seek help. So I will share all of that. And then I have one last question for each of you. In the patient population, I would say the one population I struggle with when screening for vestibulodynia and they're presenting with signs and symptoms with hormonally mediated, but their birth control is really helping manage their painful periods. I know that there's not one best answer and it's probably situation. Are there other options for those wanting both contraception, but also to minimize the vestibular pain to get treatment as they're undergoing an endo diagnosis? Or what is your recommendation for that? We're very anti-hormonal uh, related contraception. It's awful what it does. It causes atrophy of clitoris, resorption of the labia, vestibular pain, shrinkage of the internal anterior vaginal wall, the prostate tissue. But I think you gave a different scenario. We're, we're looking at not liking people on chronic birth control pill management. You're talking more of an acute situation where it's likely to change once the surgery, you know, excises the tissue. See the surgeon who does the excision. That's the treatment. Awesome. And then for you, Paul, I know you're doing some, you're recruiting for some research. I don't know if that's just specific in Canada, but you're doing a questionnaire. You may have mentioned the questionnaire, the DSDQ. Can you talk a little bit about that and who can participate yeah. in the study? So thanks. Yeah. So this was funded by a Canadian grant focused on patient-oriented research. And it arose when we realized that when physicians or clinicians were sometimes saying deep versus superficial pain with sexual activity, sometimes the patients had a different concept of deep and superficial, and then it was affecting the communication. So with uh, Caroline Pucal at Queen's University, we, we've developed a, a patient-reported outcome questionnaire that helps patients and clinicians be on the same page in terms of 
anatomically where they're feeling the pain. And so we developed it with patient partners and clinicians and uh, we'll submit it publication. And we're now working on the um, psychometric validation. So uh, yeah, so we're, we're excited about that project. We are actually trying to recruit awesome. people. to Congratulations. The questionnaire would be greatly useful. Wow. Are you recruiting outside of Canada or how can people find that research that can participate? Yeah. So I think later this year, we'll be doing another round of psychometric validation and reaching out beyond where we've been recruiting so far. So if you or others could reach out to your networks, I think that'd be really helpful. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. Any last words, thoughts? So appreciate your time. We love Jandra. Thank you, Jandra, for being you, for putting this together, for making this a vehicle to educate people. It's just so important. And uh, God bless you. Agree. Thank you. Some things you said set off light bulbs in my head. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to remember them. Awesome. I'm glad. And I always love talking to you both. And I love this wish. It, it changed my career path, my knowledge of so many things. And it's a really great society to be part of and get getting involved in. I know that there is a patient advocacy branch, too, yes, I sir. believe. There so. is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so president one day, Jandra. That's, that's my goal. Get you president. <laughs> That's uh, some hard footsteps to follow after, after Sue. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged, presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms, at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis.